Thanks for sharing. Sweet. All right. Okay. Well, Malcolm and I are uh, basically going to be introducing you to medicinal mushrooms today. This is sort of going to be medicinal mushrooms 101. And this is sort of to prepare people for the medicinal mushroom symposium that we have starting next week, where we've got all sorts of neat experts from around the, the world, top experts in the field of mycology and herbalism. And, you know, for a lot of those people, this kind of information is uh, for beginners. So a lot of this information, uh, it's just gonna help you get you primed and it's gonna be fun. And well, yeah, Malcolm, we came up with the idea of this class of meeting the royal family of mushrooms. Because these mushrooms do indeed each have their own personalities. Uh, they're similar in a lot of ways. But each medicinal mushroom is unique and special in its own way. So we're really going to be exploring that today. We're going to get into some of the lore, the legends, the traditional uses of these mushrooms. It's going to be it's going to be kind of phenomenal, hey, Malcolm? That's right. And we'll, we'll feed you lots of mushroom samples as well. So we're going to pre prepare a couple of things. And uh, we've got about 90 minutes. There's a whole bunch of folks online as well. You never know who's going to show up. So I'm really glad you guys showed up in person. We're going to have fun for the next hour and a half. Uh, how many of you have been to a class with Denise? Oh, so good number. First timers. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Well, welcome. This is the light cellar. There's our teaching kitchens, production kitchen, Monday to Friday. And then uh, on the weekends, we do lots of classes. And uh, yeah, fungi is one of our kind of core interests, core offerings. And uh, I know you're here because you know a little bit about mushrooms. So you know a lot about mushrooms. And uh, we're going to talk about the whole royal family. And uh, that's that's not official. That's just kind of something that he came up with. Yeah, it's kind of, of uh, uh, personifying uh, these mushrooms. You often hear about, you know, Reishi the or yeah, Reishi the Queen and Shaga the King. And so we just kind of extended that analogy as we're going to talk about uh, the benefits of these particular fungi. Okay, well we've got a lot to go through here. So who's ready to get started? All right. Okay. Are you ready to meet your very your first mushroom in the royal family? All right. Okay, our first mushroom we're going to meet is. Uh, let's see right here. Do that one. Oh, how anticlimactic! There oh. it is. Uh oh. Uh -huh. Okay, the first mushroom we're going to meet is Reishi, and we call her the Queen. Queen Reishi, uh, the Queen of Hearts, is uh, uh, very interesting. We're going to see why Reishi might be one of the best herbs for the heart there's a very interesting feeling you get when you start taking the reishi and i i can only just you might be able to describe it as getting mothered drinking reishi tea is comforting and nourishing and it's a very interesting feeling to get mothered by a mushroom but yes i can i can say i might have felt this uh Healing. So when we're talking about the medicinal mushrooms, it's always important to say the Latin names out loud. That's the really way you're going to get to know them. <laughs> so reishi in Latin is Ganoderma lucidum, which means the mushroom with the shining skin. And as you see here, this is the actual reishi mushroom. And uh, it is also called the lacquered cock. So this is naturally the way the reishi mushroom grows. Let's see it's special. You can see it's kind of special because of that. None of the other medicinal mushrooms have this really cool shining appearance. And we'll pass this around here, but it also kind of does resemble a heart, doesn't it? It also kind of resembles a kidney, right? Interestingly. And also it sure does look like the liver. So it's, it's very neat. It's very neat. Well, we're gonna pass this around. Take a good look at that. So Reishi, the queen of hearts. It's 
see if I can figure this out. Oh, it's just taking its time. <laughs> okay, so to really go back to the or to go. So Reishi has been treasured for millennia and millennia and millennia, even going back to our primate ancestors. Gorillas enjoy this mushroom. Deer eat this mushroom. Squirrels eat this mushroom. Birds eat these mushrooms. So there is a long history of human use of Reishi. The very first written account of Reishi, we got to go back to ancient China. And to Shen Nong, the divine farmer. So Shen Nong was kind of this legendary dude. Can everyone see this projected stream all right? I can turn down some lights if not, but you can read that. So this is, Shen Nong actually classified all the herbs in the Chinese Materia Medica into superior herbs and inferior herbs. Not only that, but he talks about minerals and uh, all sorts of interesting things. But when he classified these herbs, he put reishi mushroom as the number one herb, the number one superior herb. So in his classification of a superior herb, reishi is considered, well, to be considered a superior herb, it's a herb that has to be safe to consume uh, in large quantities over a length of time. So the inferior herbs are the ones with more direct actions that it, you wouldn't want to be taking for a long time. So these are, these are actually called the tonic herbs in Chinese medicine. And they can be considered food for the human body. So this guy really loved the reishi. But yes, red, red reishi is bitter and balanced. It mainly treats binding in the chest. It boosts the heart chi, supplements the center. That's very interesting. In the Chinese medicine, the center is your adrenals. It sharpens the wits and causes people not to forget. Protracted taking may make the body light, prevent senility, and prolong life so as to make one an immortal. So, well, I've been taking quite a bit of it. I'm going to see what happens to me. <laughs> yeah, I've been running around getting stuff for a drink, but I want to jump in this idea of how each of these mushrooms has their own kind of personality, their own character. Um, energy benefits, that type of thing. And uh, Angela, who's uh, a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, she's been working here a couple of months. She's been a part of the community. And uh, since she's been working here, she's like, I really got to get into these mushrooms, you know? And so she's actually doing, uh, I believe it's two weeks of just one single mushroom, you know, taking it every day, just really kind of getting into the energetics of it uh, and experience them kind of one at a time. So as we go through these, that might pique your interest, a strategy to try to, uh, yeah, explore them, get to know their benefits and their energetics. So we've, we've been joking, ah, it's uh, Angela and Reishi this week. You know, she's really calm. She's really <laughs> chill. <laughs> nice. uh, next week it's on Cordyceps. I expect a lot of productivity. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, how much Reishi did I take to... <laughs> prepare this presentation. Okay, a question from the audience. Does reishi mushroom grow locally? And the answer is absolutely yes. We have, especially in Alberta, we have the species Ganoderma aplanatum, the artist's palm. And it is our reishi. And some people even consider it to be stronger than the red reishi. So it's yeah, it's cool. There's gonna be we're gonna talk about the yeah. So few reishi is one of those things that actually grows on every continent in the world except for Antarctica, because um, <laughs> it's got to grow on trees. And yeah, each Ganoderma species, depending on the area that it grows, this one is the Aplanatum, as Denis had said, and uh, it's known as the Artis conch. And the underneath that pore uh, pad. Um, when it's fresh, it's just enough where you can kind of like etch into it. And uh, it's hard to see now, it's faded a little bit, 
but uh, Yara Willard had done that, picked this mushroom and then did a little artwork on the, underneath for us. So I'll pass that around. And all the Ganoderma species have very, very similar properties, but it's the Ganoderma uh, lucidum. And Ganoderma means shiny skin. Gana, gano meaning shiny, derma meaning skin. Uh, the red reishi is, is the one that's famed from the Orient that has this long history of use. But yet, as you look at other cultures, they had their own Ganoderma species. And even within Canada, we have, I think, at least three, probably more uh, different Ganoderma species. So on the West Coast, we have Ganoderma organensi, uh, which is what they call the West Coast reishi. And again, it looks different than these two, but almost identical properties. Out in the east, it is Ganoderma suga. Suga, that's right. Yeah. Which means growing on hemlock, which is very interesting. It, these things grow on hardwood trees. Yeah. And unlike a lot of the other mushrooms, the medicinal mushrooms specifically, uh, these are kind of annual fruiting bodies. Right. So the actual mushroom, our mycelium, uh, is kind of within the tree, and it's a, a saprophytic fungi, meaning it's breaking down uh, the tree. And then each mm -hmm. year it puts up a fruiting body, which is what we know of as a mushroom. And in, in fact, it concentrates the medicinal substances from the trees that it's eating. And it's very cool because you can get uh, like, this is reishi that has been grown on a substrate of 40 different herbs. And it has been found to have a completely different chemistry than some of the ones grown on certain kinds of wood. So very cool, like uh, very neat. But yes, it's concentrating the medicine of the trees. So if we take a look here. Here's a uh, ah, here's another picture of uh, here's another picture of Shen Nong, and that's he's like very happily going around barefoot picking reishis here. But these are some of the uh, Chinese herbal, traditional Chinese medicine actions of reishi. Very interestingly, it translates to spiritual vegetable meat, which I always thought very, very interesting. We have actions to benefit the joints. And what we're discovering about reishi is that it's tremendously anti-inflammatory. It's one of its major actions. Protect the spirits. Very interesting action. Benefits pure energy. I would, I would like as much as that as I can get. Strengthen the tendons and bones and improve complexion. It's true that this is one of the best herbs for the liver. And it's said when you start drinking reishi, you'll become very beautiful. Yeah. Oh, why, thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so indications. This... This is when a herb is indicated. So if anyone has any of these symptoms, this is when a Chinese herb doctor would prescribe for you reishi. But deficiency fatigue, that's adrenal fatigue, cough, asthma, insomnia, indigestion, deafness, coronary heart disease, and irregular heartbeats. So they've known about this for millennia really neat stuff how much of this how many of these actions do you think are related to stress nah and that's really our next really important definition here um, it's just taking its time yeah <laughs> 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 Oh. <laughs> yeah, what? I imagine so. I imagine it would have a. It is known to boost memory, right? Very neat. Okay, and then here's an. This is a very other, uh, very interesting term in Chinese medicine, uh, where the human body is made of three different uh, energies. You've got your qi energy, your qi. It's really good for movement. You've got your jing energy, which is hormonal uh, adrenal energy. And then you've got this third energy called the shen or the spirit. What is the analogy again, Malcolm, of the candle? Here's the candle. 
Um, so I like to do the personifications. So if you think about chi, the personification, you know, we think, again, we think of chi as energy uh, would be, you know, like a rock star, right? They're just like full of energy and they're fireworks. Um, but, you know, we tend to run out of that energy. Our chi is our daily energy. We get it from breathing. We can help regulate our chi through breath. The food we consume every day also helps with chi. Uh, but sometimes you reach that two o'clock, that little slump, you know, like you're tired. And then what happens? You get a second wind. And now you're tapping into those deeper energy reserves, which are your jing. So the personification of chi could be a rock star. The personification of jing would be, you know, a boxer in the ninth round. You know, like who's got the staying power? Who's got the stamina to really, you know, continue and keep going? And then the personification of shen could be the Dalai Lama. You know, somebody who's, who's radiant, who has a very stable mind, a nice, peaceful, uh, you know, vibe about them. So the candle analogy in, in that Jing, Qi, and Shen is, you know, the flame is the Qi, uh, giving off that heat. And the candle, depending how kind of uh, large, how thick it is, will determine how long that's going to burn, which is also determines, you know, the amount of energy and the light that's given off of it. And then the shen in the candle analogy would just be that that light and it that is nice the light warm, of the candle, warm glow. They say you can tell when a person has a strong shen when they have a light in their eyes. That's when you can see the shen when their eyes are bright. It's very interesting, but it and it really reflects the emotional body. So the word shen does not mean the soul or your individual spirit. It is a person's mind slash consciousness and emotional balance. So when you have a Shen disturbance, this is uh, when you're, emotion you're being very emotional. And well, I wonder how many people I've been using Reishi as a first aid herb, an emotional first aid herb in this last uh, three years. It just calms you right down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, disturbances of Shen produce anxiety, insomnia, bad dreams, moodiness, listlessness, and poor memory. Would Is this the promise of Reishi, that we can be free of these things? Well, it might be. It might just be. Yeah, so Reishi, you know, classically can be viewed as a, a three treasure tonic. So it's going to nourish the Jing, the Qi, the Shen. And if we come back to that last slide, we can see uh, some of those benefits, right? Like benefiting that pure energy, like you said. Uh, Protecting the spirits. Yeah. Uh, although maybe it's most, it's, it's most strong as a Shen tonic. Yeah. And they say that the Shen uh, lives in the heart. So your Shen, your spirit energy comes from your heart. And when... You're taking reishi. It is actually a heart-opening herb. The tight or binded chest is when your heart is... It, your heart is a big muscle, right? And reishi is famous for helping with muscular tension. So when your heart is a big muscle, it can just relax. And all sorts of things become possible. So what we're uh, sharing with you here is wild reishi. So this is the Ganoderma suge uh, harvested from uh, Ontario. Uh, and they say that though it is a three treasure tonic, you know, it's primarily a shen tonic. And in particular, if it's a wild reishi, so growing in the forest. And I always love to use the analogy <laughs> of like forest bathing. You know, like Denise said, what, what it is grown oh, on, yeah. the substrate, uh, matters. And we'll talk a little bit about that with cordyceps, you know, how they're grown, chemical constituency. But if you can imagine, you know, this reishi is just, yeah, absorbing I love these, all uh, the good juju of the forest. I love these little Chinese uh, statues I found depicting reishi. Uh, look how happy and serene that guy is with his bus bucket of reishi. <laughs> that other guy looks really, really happy. He's, uh, but yeah, you can see those are little reishis in the all right, and we got a question over here. All right, so oh, yeah. online, thank you, Samantha. Everyone just type in your questions any time as we go. So question is, when you speak of using reishi, do you mean as a tea or a dried herb? Oh, okay. Can you eat reishi as a raw or cooked mushroom? <laughs> you might have a hard time 
you might have a hard time. We're actually, that's going to uh, on the next slide, actually. Okay. So talking about how to consume the reishi. All right. We'll get right to it then. But yeah, the, one of the most important definitions for you when talking about medicinal mushrooms is this, def, this word called adaptogen. An adaptogen is a class of herbs, and it's actually an action of herbs. So a herb can be adaptogenic. And it literally means a herb or substance that allows you to adapt to stressful circumstances. A herb that generates adaptation to stress. It's very interesting. And these are very elite herbs. When you look at these adaptogens, got the book over here somewhere. Oh yeah, that big one. Yeah, yeah I wanna share a little anecdote about uh, Denis when he first started working here. I think it's, uh, it's pretty apt for the uh, the last slide we we're just looking at with those oh. those happy people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the slide's not going to go back, but you can remember their faces, right? They were so happy, and uh, this was a number of years ago. Um, I remember uh, my daughter; she was fairly young at the time, and reading her stories about you know like this king that lived off in the far off land, and he was singing all the time because he was happy. <laughs> and my daughter says, "Oh, that's kind of like Denis, isn't it?" <laughs> always got a song in his heart you know absolutely absolutely okay we got a couple uh, newcomers here but uh absolutely so when you consume an adaptogenic substance what's happening is the stress is still there geez you still have a million things to do on your to-do list but by consuming the adaptogenic substance the stress does not affect your internal organs. Stress affects every organ of the body, every glandular system, right? When you're taking reishi, most, most of these mushrooms are considered adaptogenic, in fact. But there's something that happens, and I believe it's something that happens in the mind. You just aren't worried about... Yeah, Dr. Terry Willard, he calls uh, reishi, you know, meditation in a cup in that regard. Helps protect the academic from their own mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very much treasured as a, a way to quiet the mind. And we were seeing how it can be really helpful for anxiety and insomnia and these kind of things. But yes, I really like this definition of adaption from David Hoffman, the great herbalist, but an herb that increases resistance and resilience to stress, enabling the body to avoid collapse because it can adapt around the problem. These adaption herbs are nourishing the body. They could be considered food, nutritive herbs. Uh, they're giving the body the building materials it needs, in the case of reishi, to build and generate hormones. So, Stress, of course, we draw from all our other gl glands to, to produce adrenal hormones, right? When you run out of th that, uh, you know, things start to happen in the brain, in the thyroid, and in other places, too. We'll get there. There's another really good quote here from Ron Teagarden, the founder of Dragon Herbs. Reishi is indeed the supreme protector, protecting us on every level, phys physically, immunologically, mentally, and spiritually. It helps us to adapt to the world and provides additional power for us to achieve a superior level of life. When we are so protected and so provided for, we can achieve things that would otherwise be impossible. This is why Reishi is called the herb of good fortune. Good luck. And Oh, yeah, a very interesting question from the audience. Is reishi good for pregnancy? There is a term out there. Well, so this is one of those reishi things, babies. Like, you do uh, research on herbs and pregnancy, and almost all of them are like, you know, if you are pregnant or nursing, consult your doctor before taking. There's just a massive amount of caution. Uh, but reishi is one of those ones. Um, and the reason why we have that caution and that disclaimer is obviously we're not going to ethically. Uh, 
test on uh, pregnant people. Is this safe? Oh, darn, that wasn't safe. Um, but the ones that we have and do and can are the ones that with traditional use, right? There's a long history of use in culture. So there's already that precedent that's been set. And reishi is absolutely one of those. So yeah, as Denise said, uh, the reishi baby is kind of a term, a phenomenon of women taking reishi uh, while pregnant. And it's said to bestow upon a, a very well mannered, good natured child. And of course, um, we're talking about pregnancy. We also need to talk about preconception, preconception oh. nutrition. So uh, reishi, because of the way it can get your glands all juicy uh, and restore your jing energy, right? Restore the wax of your candle. In Chinese herbalism, the chi of the child is gonna be a reflection of the parent's jing. So the more of an adrenal energy you have, uh, the more adrenal energy your child will have. Very, very cool, very neat question. Yeah, maybe take it easy on the alcohol extracts. <laughs> because reishi couldn't be considered a liver detoxifying herb as well. But it's especially in its tincture form. It's giving you some trouble, hey, Malcolm. Yeah. But you can see there this deer. Well, he's got a, some reishis on them. He's got some reishis on the, but made of gold. So you'll see reishi depicted in all this ancient Chinese and Japanese art. I have to go down. Is there a, there. sometimes we there's a, like a similar one that one is poisonous and the other one isn't. Like right. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Ronnie's got a great point here that uh, within the field of mushrooms, you need to be super careful when you're wild harvesting. Uh, there are oftentimes lookalikes. Yeah. And so have you heard this phrase that there are bold mushroom pickers? There are old mushroom pickers, but there are no bold old mushroom pickers. So be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Generally, it's... you're pretty safe when it comes to the noble tree polypores. Um, Meaning those tough, woody mushrooms with yeah. the pores on the bottom? There yeah. is a one poisonous mushroom that grows on trees that has gills. It's a gilled mushroom. On the yeah, instead of pores, it will have gills. So all the all the tree polypores are medicinal. The other thing you have to be careful of is that when you're picking them, that they're not moldy. Because sometimes, you know, you want it to be really healthy and nice on the bottom. They can get, they can perish and they'll become uh, grody. I trust you wouldn't try to make tea out of that. <laughs> okay, what's... <laughs> <laughs> Preparation, how to consume the reishi mushroom. Well, uh, what, and this goes for all the mushrooms. We're gonna actually explore a different method of preparation uh, with each different mushroom here. But for reishi, one of the easiest ways is a decoction. So decoction, you cannot just pour hot water over these slices, hey? They are hard as wood. So what you have to do in Chinese medicine, they say, you have to make a broth out of the reishi. So you actually have to simmer it for at least 20 minutes, gently. 20 minutes, you're gonna have a nice tea and you can continue to re-brew the same mushroom slices over and over again. The other famous thing to do is once you have that broth, it is actually so good to cook rice with, very famous, and also to make soup broths with, so. Sometimes I'll make a reishi ramen broth and it is a good way. It is a good way to ingest your reishi. So how did everyone like the tea? That the tea you had was from the wild Canadian reishi and it's different. It's not as bitter as the, the red reishi. That being said, the bitter aspect of the reishi is one of its healing powers. So the bitterness of the red reishi is where you're getting all the kind of liver healing and liver regeneration going on. Yeah. 
So very easy. And people will do this in like a crock pot. They'll just put their crock pot on low and fill it up every morning and or every night, you know, slurp down the reishi. And you can store the stuff in the fridge for a little while. Something I didn't mention, but it's really interesting to note is that reishi is featured in a lot of different herbal formulas. So one herb that was combined with reishi quite a lot is actually ginger. So ginger acts as a sort of a, you know, a potentiator. It'll drive the reishi deeper. So there's all sorts of different things that you could combine to decoct here. Shizander berries are another famous one you mix there. Goji berries, herbs that require decoction. I wouldn't throw my peppermint tea in there with the slices because peppermint tea you'd lose all the nice aromatics, right? So herbs that require decoction, you can combine. It's very nice, all right. Okay, I think we're ready to move on here on the reishi. Oops. Uh oh. Oh, an instant pot, hey? Uh, sure. Yeah, that would work. Why not? Yeah, yeah. So even high heat, high pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's nothing. Uh, the compounds we're after aren't, aren't fragile in that way. But what we do want to bust open is that tough cellulose. So instant pot would absolutely work. Yeah. And it's very traditional uh, in Chinese cultures to add things like reishi to even uh, soups and broths. Mm -hmm. no, again, not to kind of eat, but to simmer away and extract into the soup. And it's amazing, you know, you make a, a stock, of, you know, whether it's meat stock, veggie broth, whatever it is, throw those mushrooms in there and it's now just getting in, into the household, into the whole family. We're just eating soup, you know? That's very good. So yeah, I mean, part of our presentation today too, we're uh, kind of priming you up, getting you excited for the Mushroom Symposium. So we do have Yarrow Willard himself, the herbal Jedi, founder of Wild Rose College and, well, no, founder of Harmonic Arts Botanical Dispensary. And right now he's the coordinator of the Wild Rose College of Herbalism. And he's kind of our uh, keynote speaker opening everything up on so, on the Monday night? Yeah, so he's going to do a deep dive into uh, all those different Ganoderma species like we talked about, at least three or four in Canada. There's several more in the States as well. Um, but yeah, just to get a fuller picture of the Ganoderma species. Yeah, so that's going to be kind of fun. It'll be online, yeah. He's based out of Vancouver Island. And uh, oh, oh, so when oh. we host him on Tuesday as well, uh, he'll be talking about uh, the mushroom supplement industry and it'll be online as well. No, no. Yeah, it might not be to the fall till we get him back. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Anya. Despite this question. Okay. Oh yes. yeah. Can you miss that slide? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If Chag is the king, Reishi's the queen. Yeah. Okay. We We're just moving on from uh, Reishi here, but we do have a good question here for online from Marilina. Is it okay to eat the dehydrated Reishi bits after you strain the tea? You know, it's you're probably not going to get much out of there. Yeah, it won't harm you. It'd be like eating eating wood in that sense. Yeah. And, yeah. So um, it'll pass through a little bit of roughage, some fiber. Oh, okay, really good question. How do you get the mushroom powder? Um, so, so something like this, you know, you can get these mushrooms in powdered extract form. Two different yeah. ways that they're doing it, either just steam extract. So the New Earth Organics, for instance, they just apply a uh, steam, which basically breaks down that cellulose, releases the uh, compounds, and then it's just dried back to a powder. And then uh, these ones here uh, are done as what's called a dual extract. So it's hot water as a tea, but then also ethanol, alcohol, which Denny will talk about. Uh, yeah, each different mushroom, we're gonna talk about a different uh, method of consuming them. Yeah. So, so we're gonna talk about the extract powders here coming up, but all right. I really, really the best method of ingesting the mushrooms is what's gonna be the easiest way for you to do it. If it's easier for you to have a crock pot on the counter and have your tea, that is a very 
economical way to go. And if you, uh, you know, if it's easier for you to have an instant dissolvable extract powder uh, that you can just throw into your soups, throw into your coffee, whatever, that's going to be the easiest for you. We're going we're gonna to have some fun when we get there. Okay, another question from the audience here, yeah? Easy and quick. What I've done before, Oops. but I don't think, and now I'm thinking about getting the benefits of it. You know, I take the you know little chunks, yeah. and then they might an extra bit of powder, right? And then I just put it in the next part, and then they just it's just like cheap. But I don't actually cook it. So am I missing out on like all the benefits or my like, uh, Yeah, really good question. So uh, Ronnie's got a method of basically grinding it up, kind of kind of like how we got this uh, reishi powder here. So it's it's the raw mushroom just kind of ground up yeah. into little bits and pieces. And a hot water steeping, just pouring over hot water onto it, will get some, but not all. Yeah, so you're missing out on, on much more that could be extracted. And you'll Definitely always tried know to, by... We've tried sticking it in an espresso machine too. That was delicious, actually. <laughs> but... One thing I'd recommend doing is uh, if you're doing that, keep re-steeping and re-steeping until you're not getting any color. Keep, yeah. keep re-steeping the same mushrooms over and over again until you, there's no color left. And then you're, that's when you know you've gotten everything out of it. Yeah, color and flavor. But if I'm not cleaning it, yeah, still for sure. Yeah, so if you simmered it, nice low simmer, you'll see it'll get a lot stronger. Yeah. All right, so here, uh, okay, are we ready to move on to the, are you ready to meet the king of all the mushrooms? I know it's hard to, it, it was hard to choose how to name them, but chaga has been called the king for a long time. And I think there's a reason for that because it is so, it's like a, the benevolent uh, emperor that, uh, it just kind of really protects you. Yeah, so are. protective. Oh, no. <laughs> there she here we got some nice chaga chunks here from uh, Ontario, actually. Yeah. And there's a nice real specimen of the chaga. A little cross section. Uh, so it does grow on a birch tree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The benefits of chaga are astonishing and astounding. Uh, the science behind it is wild. But basically, the chaga grows in a symbiotic relationship with birch trees. It's actually, uh, I go chaga hunting uh, every winter. And we actually, the higher up the birch tree, the chaga grows, the more medicinal it's said to be. But yeah, <laughs> it's pretty fun up there. It's pretty fun all the way up there. But uh, yeah, we do have a lot of chaga in Alberta. It grows in the boreal. And you yeah. notice the snow on the ground. So this is one that you can access year round. And you like to go in the winter as well is kind of your best time of year. Oh yeah, because where it grows, it's a lot of muskeg. So when it's all frozen, you can travel in the landscape a lot easier. Yeah, a review of the health benefits of chaga. So this is all from the, the scientific literature. So all of these have been, um, you know, these are all from uh, modern research. But yeah, if we go through it, it's like, what does the chaga not do? So it's analgesic and anodyne. These are, means pain relieving. So really good for inflammation. When you've been on your feet all darn day and poor, poor little dogs are tired or whatever. <laughs> good how they say that. You know, you get, when you got some pain. And the other interesting aspect is anti-allergenic. So all these medicinal mushrooms are known to be immunomodulators. So they can bring down an overactive immune system. They can bring up an underperforming immune system. So that's when we, we're looking at reishi, that's where you see it's so good for asthma. So anti-allergenic, antibacterial, anti-cancer, anti-hyperglycemic. It can really help with blood sugar. Anti-inflammatory, anti-lipid peroxidative. So very strong antioxidant, uh, anti-mutagenic, anti-nociceptive, reduces sensitivity to painful stimuli. I don't think I'd like to be part of that research study. 
maybe, maybe. Antioxidant, antiparasitic. Interestingly, yeah. that has to do with your white blood cells. Well, and in fact, that was a question that came online. Uh, are, is there any anti-parasitic anti effects from the mushrooms? So certain ones actually have really good anti-parasitic qualities. Um, they actually have antifungal properties. Wait a minute, fungi, right? Being antifungal, yeah. When you think about the kingdom of fungi, all the way from single-celled yeast, all the way up to these different types of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they need to protect themselves too and have antifungal properties. Yeah, so some of these mushrooms are, have been found a very effective anti-candida herbs too. And uh, are we going to talk about birch polypore or should I even mention that now? Oh, that's uh, in the honorable mentions. Honorable perhaps. mentions, yeah. I'll just mention it now. When we get to birch polypore, that one is also anti parasitic as well. And uh, Otzi the Iceman, one of the oldest human specimens, well preserved specimens we've ever found and been able to research, he had uh, two species of fungi on him. And one of them was the birch polypore that he was using specifically as an anti parasitic. This is a guy frozen in the ice thousands of years ago that perfectly preserved, we took a look at him, and saw what, you know, state of his health he was in, what he had on him. And uh, yeah, birch polypore was, was being used as an antiparasitic. And I know these are, uh, this is like a whole language, isn't it? This is the language of herbalism. So we're going to see, we're going to see, see here some interesting like uh, similarities with reishi as far as the antiplatelet aggregative effects. So good for the blood, anti-tumor, antiviral, blood purifier, blood sugar balancer, cardioprotective, fights bronchitis, improves circulation, immunomodulating, induces apoptosis. So this is one of the most important things about the chaga. It actually causes this cell death of cancer cells which is uh, one of the major reasons you would want to start taking chaga. It's, uh, it's especially good for the inoperable, inoperable kind of stuff where uh, it's just so deep in that uh, a surgery won't do much. So very famous for those uh, sorts anyway. Yeah, it also, it also has this intestinal protection effect. So colitis, gastritis, digestive inflammation. This all has to do with the immune system as well, but and reducing the inflammation. Liver purification and detoxification lowers harmful LDL. Like, who wouldn't want these uh, benefits, eh? It's a... Uh... <laughs> It's all very, uh, it's, it's a treasure that we have these mushrooms in Canada and people don't even really realize it. Like, I wonder how much chaga does end up in the wood, like it getting chipped up and yeah, mulched. So, so we specifically work with uh, people that source chaga from the wild. Uh, it's one of those ones that's not cultivated uh, as a mushroom. And so our guy out in Ontario, we have two sources, New Brunswick and Ontario. So in Ontario, they specifically find places that are mm. about to be clear cut, and then they go in and harvest as much medicine as possible because it's, as Denise said, it's all going into the wood chipper or, you know, whatever uh, turned into mulch. And there's a lot of medicine that uh, is left on the table in that regard. So um, I really like this quote. It's from, it's from this book that uh, it actually popularized Chaga in the 50s in Russia. But it's... Uh, from the book called The Cancer Ward. And in this book, the guy discovers chaga and he starts drinking and he gets well. But yeah, he could not imagine any greater joy than to go away into the woods for months on end to break off this chaga, crumble it, boil it up on a campfire, drink it and get well like an animal, just as a dog goes to search for some mysterious grass that will save him. Is this where you're getting your dog analogy from before? <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Yeah. So very, very, really neat stuff. And then, yeah, just bottom. Okay. 
is a question for each other. Yeah, absolutely. Is it sometimes like flat and burnt on the outside? Always. Always. Okay, great question. So here's here's a chaga again, cross section from the birch, and you can see it does have that kind of like uh, blackened, charred outside, but the inside uh, is bright orange. So um, there's a Native American skeleton, it should be like this massive thing of chaga. It's like giant. And then it's like black and white. Like, so I thought, oh, this is a good one. So I tried to make myself, I got like screaming. I thought, okay, well, this is. Um, so I just stopped, and then so somebody said, "Oh no, the black is somehow better." And I'm like, "Well, what is it? It's good meat. That is the black part, the orange part." Or you might have taken too much, possibly too. You brewed it up too much, too strong. I didn't really brew it. Oh, you didn't. Oh, didn't. Oh. right. Okay. Mysterious. Uh, so, question from the audience was about um, having headaches from the chaga. You know, it's so important to really process the chaga well. There is, for example, when you harvest and pick it, you want to chunk it up right away so it dries really well. Because there, believe it or not, it can get moldy. So perhaps you experienced, uh, that's just my guess, uh, mycotoxicity, like a mold reaction. That's my guess, but with e each person, you know, you're going to have different reactions so some people indeed i've heard uh you know even reishi sometimes can give people headaches and stuff so trust your own body and trust your own intuition proud of you for trying to drink the chaga okay and this brings us well for the mushroom symposium we're going to learn a lot more about chaga from our good friend alex O'Whalen. And uh, his presentation is going to be take, uh, taking us uh, for a day of foraging for chaga in the boreal with him. So that's going to be super fun. And we actually have some of uh, this. Uh, so his company here is the Boreal Bound Botanicals. So this is chaga that he picked. Well, he and I picked this chaga from the northern Alberta, and we sang songs to it. And the idea is that it's kind of like an elderberry syrup. So I'm going to pass this around. It's got a little bit of maple syrup in there, a little bit of vanilla. Oh, yeah. There you go. So if you're comfortable, uh, maybe just squirt it into your little jar and see, see how it is there. But uh, Alex's whole motto is that when you drink the chaga, the feeling you get is being in the forest. That soothing feeling of being in the wild. Okay, we got a question from the audience here. All right, Denis, how much and how often uh, oh, yeah. do you or can you take up the chaga syrup? What do you recommend? So the idea is that it's like an, this chaga syrup is like an elderberry syrup. So it does have an alcohol content. Uh, I mean, if I'm really feeling like I need it, I'll take a whole shot glass full. And just, you know, sometimes you do need to take medicinal mushrooms in big doses like that. Well, especially if you're on your feet all day or you're in pain, right? But two or three squirts a day is a tablespoon a day, a teaspoon a day. Yeah, it's a great question. So all the mushrooms we're talking about can be uh, taken more as like an everyday adaptogen, tonic, but also can be taken uh, in larger doses. Oh, the first sign of a cold or it's going around the office and you want to kind of protect yourself. Or like Denise said, you come home, you know, oh. it's been a long day. I mean, I think that's what you're getting with your like, you know, your your feet are uh, sore. Yeah. You know, that deep jing restorative. Uh, that's what chaga I would say is primarily a jing uh, substance. Yeah, like a... there's this idea that chaga, it's more esoteric, but they say it is a levitational substance in herbalism where it'll actually make you feel light. And that was when we, that very first quote about reishi, when Shen Nong, the divine farmer, is talking about it will make your body feel light. It, it's literally that, you know, the things that are weighing down on you 
all of a sudden don't weigh so much kind of thing. So it's like, oh, pretty good. It's feeling pretty good here. Your spirits are lifted. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I usually recommend like a teaspoon in your coffee, tablespoon in your ah, ah, Yeah, but it's not stimulating, you know, like so it won't keep you up at night if, if you uh, do consume it. Okay. All right. Okay. Is everyone ready to move on to our next royal family member? Okay, we got a great question from the online audience though. This is from Naomi. I am about to make some bone broth. Would it work to add chaga, reishi, et cetera, while it is simmering? Absolutely 100%. <laughs> you bet, Naomi. Okay, so we're moving on here to cordyceps. The prince, we wanted to call it the knight because Truly, cordyceps of all the medicinal mushrooms is one that's very famous for athletes. It's one of the mushrooms that can help with energy. And this is the chi energy. And it's true. Cordyceps is something found uh, growing on insects. It's an insectivorous mushroom. And uh, we'll pass around a little sound. Well, we'll pass around a little specimen for you guys to check out. The mushroom has literally consumed the entire body of the insect and has grown a little fruiting body here. So that's entire body of the insect has been consumed. Pass that around and check it out. It's pretty neat. Of course, <laughs> Cordyceps these days are cultivated uh, on a substrate. There are no, you can buy the wild ones that, you can buy the wild ones that are uh, grown from the insects. They're very expensive low, going for $3,000 a kilo at the moment. And- So that one we're little passing around, what would that cost? Just that one? Uh, that was 10 bucks, <laughs> 10 bucks. That's a pretty good deal, actually. Yeah, yeah, for that whole one. That's, uh, a, that's, a, that's a wild one from South America, I believe, right? Yeah, that one's from Peru. Yeah, so cordyceps is another, it's a type of fungus you can find all around the world. Uh, there's ones in Alberta you can find, and you know you found them when the uh, little mushroom fruiting bodies sticking out of the head of an insect. So they can parasitize uh, worms and ants and all kinds of insects. And of course, there's this famous TV show that was recorded in Calgary called The Best or The Last of Us. And uh, yeah, people are now scared of cordyceps because they think it's going to infect their brain and turn them into a zombie. Well, if you're an insect, then you're at risk. But uh, um, th there is, in fact, a fungus that will infect you, take over your brain and turn you into a zombie. Does anybody know what that fungus is? <laughs> It's not the TV, it's not the internet, it is another living organism. Although the internet and uh, social media is very mycelial in, <laughs> in nature. But what, uh, yeah. what Malcolm is alluding to is candida yeasts. They are proven to, if they go out of control in your gut, well, they are fungi, right? They're fungal in origin. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they can make you do all sorts of weird things. They can make you grumpy when you haven't been feeding them properly. They, they like sugar. They like eating sugar. So bless you, bless you. They like eating sugars. And there's even a theory out there that candida is the mycelium of a bigger fungus. The fruiting body is cancer tumors. This is one theory of cancer, that it is a fungi, fungal in origin. And it lives from what you've got inside you. But yes, uh, candida can make you do, you know, stop at the Timbits or whatever. Stop for some Timbits <laughs> on the way to work and all this kind of stuff. It's very interesting, very interesting stuff. Anyway, cordyceps, so here's a picture in Tibet. So the origins of cordyceps as we know it um, are from 
extremely high altitude environments. They grow high, high in the Himalayas there. And it is actually those stressful circumstances that provide for us, um, you know, these stress relieving benefits. Because one day it can be minus 40 with the wind chill, the next day plus eight or plus 12, 50 degrees swings in temperature. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Extremely stressful circumstances. Apparently we do have cordyceps in Alberta. I just haven't found one yet. That's on my bucket list. Cordyceps was, has always been incredibly expensive. Back in the time of the Chinese emperors, they were literally paying $10,000 in silver coin for uh, these wild cordyceps. Luckily now we can actually cultivate them. Uh, which is great because it's a lot less expensive. So, for example, this jar of cordyceps powder extract, this, this is like, I don't know how much it is right now actually out there, but, you know, it's like 20 or 30 bucks. This is an eight to one extract. So, literally, it's about a pound of cordyceps. So, this would be worth about $2,000 of wild cordyceps. But now, thanks to advanced cultivation technologies, see it growing on a substrate of, you know, they're growing them on all sorts of things, but now we can enjoy the benefits of the cordyceps. So the cordyceps is very famous for, uh, it's used by athletes. Um, this is another quote from Ron Tiern here, but cordyceps would be called a chi tonic, something that tonifies chi energy. So who doesn't want your energy to be toned up? So chi is described as the energy for movement. When you have a lot of chi, you have the ability to move physically in the world and get a lot of things done. But yeah, cordyceps is used to strengthen the body and mind at a fundamental level, said to increase the primary motive force for life activities. That's the chi. Cordyceps specifically benefits the lower back region, the knees, and the ankles. So, strengthening these articulations. And cordyceps is also a major lung tonic. It can be used to strengthen respiratory power in those who require the extra energy to perform physical work. So yes, probably the most famous reason uh, this mushroom was so expensive is that it is considered to be one of the best aphrodisiacs in the world. For men and women, it is known to increase circulation to the peripheries. So it is good for if your fingers and toes get cold uh, when you're out in the cold, you know, it can really help with uh, bringing circulation to the extremities. And for gentlemen, that does, uh, there is one extremity in particular <laughs> that's very helpful. And, uh, you know, women do benefit from it as well, you know, uh, what I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the erectile tissue is, uh, it is uh, one of those things. The other thing that of course is very famous for is opening the lungs, right? So you can actually breathe deeper. It increases aerobic capacity. And for a lot of people, well, this is actually how we get chi energy into our body. So by increasing aerobic capacity, you can go, longer, faster, you know, this can be riding your bike or it can mean, you know, staying up all night. You know what I mean? So the chi energy is the energy to be able to move very rapidly in the world. Oh yeah. One of my favorite herbs of all time. Okay, Malcolm. So very exciting part 
All right. Okay. okay we're, we are going to be making a recipe with the cordyceps extract powder. So these extract powders are amazingly versatile because you can just, they dissolve. You can throw them. It's actually what I've been drinking in my cup here. It does open your voice up too when you drink the cordyceps. Yeah, basically instant tea because it's so, already been uh, extracted for you, then dried back down into a powder. And I've started to build the drink already, not going through every ingredient, but we still have lots of mushrooms to cover. So, so pay attention here. But when we send out the notes to everyone, uh, we're going to have the recipe in the PowerPoint. Build in here. So this is a uh, cordyceps chai with a little bit of star anise, some orange and uh yeah, so the kind of the main features are uh, the star anise hydrosol. Star anise is amazing, as you know. I'm sure you enjoy the flavor. And, um, and it's one of the famous uh, Chinese five spice blend herbs. Yeah. Delicious. Uh, one of the highest, probably actually the highest natural source of shikimic acid, which is what the pharmaceutical Tamiflu is all based around. So really inhibiting uh, respiratory viruses and flus. So then we have a cordyceps chai. So it's cordyceps with cinnamon, ginger, cardamoms, uh, cloves, black pepper. And we're gonna actually add in extra cordyceps. Now, typically these, these uh, mushroom extracts are so concentrated, you can use as little as an eighth, eighth of a teaspoon or up to half a teaspoon. Uh, but if you're Denise, sometimes you use oh, yeah. tablespoons. <laughs> yeah, when we're talking therapeutic dose of the extract powders, you know, a lot of those things, you know, you're going to find the little packets of mushroom coffee. They're only using one tenth of a teaspoon or in, the, in those. Uh, yeah. So really, that to me is not a ther very therapeutic dose. It might be placebo dose. You know, you're like, yeah, I'm going to take my cordyceps and I am going to run so fast. And it might work that way. But if you really want to feel the power of cordyceps, I recommend trying a macro dose. So we're going to do a mega dose. In Denise honor, we're going to do a macro dose. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, let's do three heaping tablespoons. Very uh, nice. Yes. Uh, and if you think about it, like, what does this cost? Like, that's three beers at a bar these days to have a whole jar. And I have consumed a whole jars in one night before. If you want to have fun, it it's kind of fun and it really highly recommended the heroic dose if you haven't tried it yet it's the best uh saturday night you might have in your life okay we have a question in the audience here oh i've never had a i've so a question from the audience can you overdose on the cordyceps uh, it's very safe it's one of those nutrient Consider it a food. That's what these superior tonic herbs are. Very safe to take in large quantities. At least I haven't, uh, I haven't met my threshold yet here. <laughs> okay, uh, another question from the audience here. How long will the extract powder last? So it's very important to keep it in a dark place. It's very important to keep it dry. But if it's in the dark, in a dry place, the compounds in medicinal mushrooms are very stable. It's not like it's not like peppermint, where you're going to have the evaporation of the aromatic compounds over time. So, three years is a. Uh, I bet you it'll be fine. I mean, yeah. Oh, uh, hopefully you don't. Yeah, hopefully they're not going to kick around in your shelves for that long. Okay, yeah. Uh, as far as it goes, would you keep your mushroom extracts in the fridge? I don't think so. You will have humidity and you will have perhaps funky, funky things in there that they would absorb the scent and stuff into. So yeah, they don't they do not need to be kept refrigerated. Chris, um, um Long the therapeutic effect of the any mushroom that you're talking about today. You just said a great point, which is it's essentially a it's essentially neural These medicinal mushrooms, yes. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a really very good question. Good question. You're going to yeah, paraphrase yeah. for the online audience here, Malcolm? All right. Well, you paraphrase and then I'll answer. Okay. The question was um, when we're talking about um, trying to help, like for cordyceps, if question is if you're trying to heal a lung or respiratory complaint, how often should you be taking it? And how much should you be taking it? I would say do not be shy. Um, you, you are going to have to see with your own body how much will work. Some people report like one squirt of cordyceps tincture a day having trim, being tremendously beneficial. So play with yourself. You really do notice cordyceps, especially when you do movement, though. If you're just sitting at your computer desk, you might not really notice the lung opening effects. But if you are doing a lot of speaking, you're going to notice it. If you're doing singing, you're going to notice the lung opening effects. And also if you're cross country skiing or doing something vigorous, that's when you're really going to notice these tremendous benefits for respiratory health. All right, Malcolm. So Malcolm, you've just whipped up. It was very spontaneous. Uh, yeah, it's mushroomy, right? You can really, really taste the cordyceps. And uh, we'll send you a perfected recipe that was just off on the fly. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's good, but it's just an example of how easy it is to throw these extract powders into any you like. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to add to answer that last question, but I'll do so when we get to it. Okay, right on. Specifically, you know, how long is it? Do you take? How long do the effects last? So, yeah. It's interesting that we might be shorter on oxygen because of what's going on in the air around us, etc. So I'm thinking that this might help with expanding the lungs, help us to better intake that oxygen that we do have available to us. Yes, 100%. Um, and in fact, Cordyceps is actually used for elevation sickness in the, in the Himalayas. So it actually oxygenates the blood, oxygenates the brain. So very good for memory and concentration, focus and alertness as well. That's why we wanted to call it the Prince. Could be Cordyceps warrior princess too, or, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, both men and women benefit equally from all of these mushrooms. Okay, moving on from cordyceps. Uh, we do have a question here from the online audience. So this is from Luke Towers. A question from Luke. Can you use more than one medicinal mushroom at once? And this is absolutely yes. You can mix all the different medicinal mushrooms together if you like and there are benefits to doing that because you're going to get a wider spectrum of all the different constituents there is something to be said though for trying each mushroom individually and really really understanding how that feels in the body yeah what does reishi do i find myself when i'm buying medicinal mushrooms. It's usually going to be cordyceps. Um, I really do enjoy the cordyceps. Uh, but the other one that I find myself purchasing quite a bit is this next one we're going to talk about, the lion's mane. And the lion's mane mushroom is actually probably the top selling medicinal mushroom right now. Here's a dried specimen. So here we see the lion's mane, the wizard. It, really, if you're looking at the mushrooms holding a royal court, the lion's mane is like uh, kind of like Gandalf, right? This keeper of wisdom. And really, that's what lion's mane is all about. Parisium. What? Why is lion's mane the most 
popular mushroom right now? Well, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It has become famous as a tonic for the brain, for the mind. And it obviously works because people keep coming back for it over and over again. And usually, People notice the benefits of lion's mane to the mind when they go off the lion's mane. You take the lion's mane for about two weeks. When you run out, it's, it's a kind of a subtle effect on the mind. But it's when you run out that you notice, it. oh, I was really feeling really good, really smart. <laughs> Okay, Malcolm, and you've got a little, you've got a nice little uh, yeah. image of what they look like. Yeah. There we are. Yeah, so this is uh, some local functions of the lion's mane. So that's literally how you find it in the forest. It looks like a little leaf, and just out of nowhere, you get this beautiful white mass of, uh, yeah, that is very tasty. Has all these medicinal benefits. Almost, well, it looks like the nervous system, right? It's very cool. That's the, uh, you can see it has these teeth. It's a toothed mushroom. It's called den, they're dendrites. Okay, so, yeah, so the name in Japan for lion's mane mushroom is Yamabushi Take. Which literally take means mushroom, and the Yamabushi are the hermits that live dwell in the forest. So these the Yamabushi still exist, and they are said to have mysterious powers. <laughs> and they love consuming this mushroom. Lion's mane was worth its weight in silver in feudal Japan. So they have been treasuring this for a long time. But yeah, you can still go visit the Yamabushis. They live in some. Japan is pretty smart. They've really done a good job keeping their forests intact for the most part. But yes, it's been treasured by monks all over the world. So the major thing going on in the lion's mane is. This compound called hericinone, which is a novel compound that they've discovered in plants. So, hericinones have been found to induce the synthesis of nerve growth factor. This may be useful for Alzheimer's and other nerve disorders. Nerve growth factor is required by the brain for developing and maintaining sensory neurons. And the wildest thing they found was that not only can it grow nerves and re regenerate nerves, and this can be uh, from not only brain nerves, but it can also be from injuries. If you've broken something and injured the nerves, it can help regenerate those as well. The wildest thing they've discovered about the lion's mane is this myelin generating effect. So now it can actually remyelinate the sheath of your nerves. So it's kind of it's kind of frightening what's out there. Uh, it's usually exposure to solvents that will dissolve the myelin sheath of your brain. So. Watch out when you're sniffing uh, that varnish, right? <laughs> <laughs> that feeling you're feeling is actually your brain being dissolved into goo. So, yeah, very fascinating this ability to grow and regenerate the brain. There's this funny little guy. Hey, uh, this is one of the Chinese immortals. Uh, here's another depiction of him with Reishi there. And he He's got a giant cone head. <laughs> There's all these theories about him being an ancient alien. He, he is like uh, the god of herbalism. 
amongst the immortals, but none of the other immortals have this giant bulbous head. My theory, this guy's been eating a lot of limited <laughs> tea. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm experimenting on myself <laughs> to see you so take some measurements here. <laughs> Try to, yeah, well, that's perhaps just a symbol of how powerful his mind is. Really. What a brainiac. You ever see this guy? Uh, you'll see him in thrift stores and stuff. It's apparently, it's just like the lucky Buddha. Instead of rubbing his belly to get wealthy, you rub his head, uh, his brain, and it'll, make, it'll fill you with wisdom. So, very cool little, uh, there's all sorts of really neat books around these mushrooms. Okay, Milk, you got the book open here for the lion's mane? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to add, and this kind of answers uh, the previous question we had. So uh, this is a book by Robert Rogers, Medicinal Mushrooms, The Human Clinical Trials, right? There's tons of research out there uh, with medicinal mushrooms. And then Robert wanted to compile a book that was just specifically about uh, the human clinical trials. So there's a ton of references in here. And one of the more famous ones in 2009, double blind placebo control uh, trial of men and, and women in Japan, they were ages 50 to 80. Uh, they already have, were showing signs of cognitive decline, split into two groups. One got the placebo, one got the lion's mane. They are given uh, four 250 milligram tablets, so one gram a day. Uh, and after two weeks, so they tested them, and at weeks eight, 12, and 16, the mushroom group showed much higher scoring on cognitive tests. So there was definitely an increase. Then there was a four-week four washout period, and then there, they began to decline again. So how long does the effects last? At least four weeks. It says, at least for lion's mane, one needs to and the lion's mane is a delicious edible mushroom so if you see it in the grocery store i have found some of the most significant benefits from eating the actual mushroom i that's when i have really really felt mushroom we have a good question online here for about the lion's mane so has it been tested in multiple sclerosis patients? Uh, not too sure. What's that other uh, debility thing that's so famous in Alberta, Malcolm? MS. 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 Is that MS? MS. Yeah. Multiple sclerosis? Fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. So, geez. I don't know what my one friend, uh, his wife, had uh, one of those two things. And it really, the lines being tremendously better for the world. I'll have to look that up for you. That was a question from Samantha. But yeah, I'll... Uh, you said so many things. What was the... Okay, multiple, multiple sclerosis. sclerosis. Yeah, okay. So uh, studies suggest that the fruiting body improves myelination, suggesting benefit in multiple sclerosis patients. That was a e Japanese 2001 study. Yeah. Uh, apparently, Alberta is really bad for this because of all the off gassing from the oil wells and stuff that they're burning. But it's all, a, it's all, humanity's learning slowly but surely. I've got a great faith. We're going into a golden age where everyone is taking their mushrooms. <laughs> there will be no stress. <laughs> No insomnia, <laughs> tremendous immunity, and brains, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, and this just, we can mention a couple uh, of the good classes coming up for the Mushroom Symposium here. We do have the author Robert Rogers talking about the future of functional fungi, using these mushrooms for specific healing actions. And then, yeah, I am... This year, I'm talking about mushrooms for memory. Uh, I actually got a pretty bad concussion just over a year or two ago now. But mushrooms are one of the things that really helped me. And I, so I, I'm really passionate about it. But yeah, we're going to be looking at really more into the physical actions of these mushrooms. How are they interacting with the body to 
to create these memory enhancing effects. So tell me, we're just teasing you today. <laughs> we're just teasing you. All right. Okay. So five minutes, and we're about to. We started now getting into the kind of honorable mentions. I wanted to name Turkey Tail a princess for one thing. She's one of the most beautiful mushrooms. <laughs> Also, I mean, there's the princess Chanterelle, the princess Tomorrow Mushroom, so a whole bunch of these characters. But Turkey Tail, really the famous action of Turkey Tail. Uh, it is this compound they found called PSK, polysaccharide something or other. It's, a, it's one of the polysaccharides that is, but it, is one of the most famous mushrooms here in regards to anti-tumor properties. Directly acts on tumor cells, but also indirectly boosts the celery, cellular immunity of the host. So turkey tail is famous as far as, uh, you know, it's been used with great success for things like breast cancers. So, but, Put it in there uh, as a princess. Oh, and there's been actual studies done with that years ago. Oh yeah, breast cancer and turkey tail. Yeah, turkey tail seems to be one of the best choices. If you're going that route. Okay, okay. So we got five minutes to go here, I think. Right. Okay, we're gonna blast through some honorable mentions here. Oh. Okay. <laughs> We also have to talk about the third method of, uh, of administrating medicinal mushrooms, and that is through tinctures. So I had a couple tinctures here. This one is the actual turkey tail. So this, do you have an open one right next? No, let me turn in. So there's a few benefits. Why would you want to consume the medicinal mushrooms as tinctures? One of the reasons that the alcohol does a tremendously good job of extracting certain properties of the mushrooms, so the resinous properties. The other real benefit of having a tincture is that it's portable and it's ready to go. It's prepared for you. You can have this in your purse and you don't have to brew a big tea or anything like that. Okay? You can just squirt some so it's instant. And it's going to be portable and convenient. The alcohol also potentiates the medicinal compounds in the mushrooms. So it actually facilitates the compounds entering your bloodstream. So tinctures can be a really good choice for when, especially if someone's digestion is impacted, they're not absorbing very well, very absorbing. And well, one of the other great benefits, of course, is guaranteeing you take your medicine, especially for some people. You know, in, Ch in Russia, they don't call tinctures tinctures. They call them medicated vodka. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you're just, you're gonna be drinking vodka anyway. That's what, that's what gin started all right? Yeah. 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 That's true to the case. Question. Yeah. So you can boil it or you can put it in alcohol extract in alcohol and you will extract high away. Yeah, so um, as far as the, the really woody medicinal mushrooms go, like the ones that are hard as wood, water by itself will not extract all the medicinal benefits. So the water soluble parts of the mushrooms are these real, the real immunity parts. The alcohol soluble parts are resins. These resins are known, uh, called the triterpenoids, the terpenes. And so it is something where, well, these powders are, you. The extract powders are called the dual extract powders because it has the alcohol extracts and the water extracts that have just been evaporated. So they have extracted those good things with the alcohol here. In, in Russia with chaga, 
apparently they just keep a big jar of vodka next to their stove. And whenever they brewed their chaga, they just toss the rest of it into the vodka and go that way. So there's some great videos out there too about how to make tinctures. It's really easy. It just takes about two weeks to do. But yeah, it's a, uh, and then the idea is to make something called a dual extracted tincture. So you tincture the mushrooms, you remove that alcohol, and then you take those mushrooms and you boil them and you mix the two of those together. It's called a dual extraction tincture. That's pretty fun. All right. All right, real quick question. Uh, what is the most effective method of delivery for mushrooms? You kind of touched upon this. It is, you know, the one you'll take, right? Yeah. You know, the, um, I would say maybe tinctures are the most direct, the most immediate, straight into the bloodstream. So it does have that benefit that way. But that being said, it's good. Eating them is good. They are edible. So I feel like the same. Okay, so we've got some, we're going into some of the honorable mentions. These mushrooms are actually, some of them are just as good as chaga and reishi. They just don't have the same pipe, you know? It's Aspen conch, amadou, tinder conch, red belt. These are all these bracket fungi like this, okay? Uh, we were gonna call them the, the magi, the three magi, or we could call them the dupes. Something like that. They're very noble. These are all the noble tree polypores. So <clears throat> this brings up uh, on Tuesday, we actually have a really the, one of the presentations with Simon, and he's talking about biomolecular mycology. This might answer a lot more questions for you about. He's going to be talking exactly how to extract the different molecules and things out of the mushroom. So that's going to be really cool with Simon. Okay, and some of the other honorable mentions, of course, are the culinary mushrooms. So here we have the oyster. And eating oysters is one of the most protected mushrooms in the world out there. So oyster mushrooms, shiitakes, the porcinis are, I need to make my mouth water. The porcini mm, is, Honestly, I treat myself to <laughs> well, eat a bag worth of those a day. <laughs> but it must be hard, hard school. Yeah, and agaricus is actually the button mushroom you'll find in the grocery store. Agaricus possesses amazing human benefits. And Wednesday, we actually have the New York Organics master herbalist, Eric Fleming. He's going to be talking about medicinal mushrooms in food as medicine. So. Really excited for that one. He's gonna be talking. You know, he's gonna be making some really neat recipes. I'll give you some ideas how to use these mushrooms in everyday life. And then, of course, honorable mention are the edible mushrooms, and that's gonna be Friday. Uh, we have Chef Alex Hamilton. He's gonna be giving us a mushroom cookery class. And then, if you're really, really interested in edible wild mushrooms. I really recommend checking out the Alberta Mycological Society. So we actually have one of uh, Candace Cullum. She leads forays for the Alberta Mycological Society. They have different, like, I think I might be able to do it when I'm a little gray in the beard. There's the world of wild mushrooms. It's, it is uh, kind of my voice. So she's been talking about foraging for mushrooms, wild mushrooms, and especially uh, why she can't. she's going to teach us how to willow weave. She's going to be willow weaving a mushroom drying basket. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, if you're really into, you want to start forging for edible mushrooms, join the Alberta Mycological Society Facebook group. And if you want to join all the forays, join their, the actual society. Oh, and then. I had no idea what I wanted to call the truffle as a, how do we fit truffles in the royal family? They're, where would they fit? They're, I don't know. 
Not quite. That's coming up. Maybe it's like the perhaps the uh, perhaps it will be the palace cooked, right? Because it's such an amazing gourmet flavor. <laughs> I once held this two hundred dollar white chocolate in my hands, and I I had to be talked out of it. I was totally <laughs> out of trouble. So and uh, so. We're getting a presentation on truffle mushrooms, magic, folklore, and gastronomy with Shadi, yeah. who uh, is a myco chef and cultural mycologist. Um, it's going to be fascinating. Totally. Yeah, she's presented at uh, such events as the Telluride Mushroom Festival, which is it's notable. Yeah, it's festival in Colorado every year. My mouth is watering right now. My mouth is watering. Yeah, we'll see where truffle. But yeah, uh, here we get to the jesters. Uh, <laughs> of course, here we have Amanita, which uh, is one of the considered magical mushrooms out there. So but it's, there is so much research that has been just coming about about not only magic mushrooms, uh, but the Amanita as well. How they can kind of reset your nervous system. Reset the pathways. So in our day-to-day -day life, we build habits, routines, we become you know, pathways in our brain. So it's hard to break those patterns of behavior. Yeah, and neural links. It's kind of like you know, driving down an alley with some ruts. And you're always those are always just going in there. Michael Pollan has a whole book on this called How to Change Your Mind. He makes uh give the analogy of like you know, using psilocybin as his ability to just like Create some new traps, you know, like not always go in those ruts all the time. So there's tons of research uh, helping with addictive behavior and these kind of things. Even uh, the will to live. It's, been, it, it's the, some of the studies are so cool. Yeah. Well, on these magic mushrooms. So we did the uh, talking about the micro and the macro dose. Yeah, so they both have their books. Yeah, very neat. Uh, uh, it's definitely we're in a very great time to be alive. I think we're on the cutting edge here. Um, the future, really, they talking about these medicinal mushrooms is so important, as you can see, right? How many of these mushrooms are going to be able to help you know our society, our people, our culture? Well. I think that's what we're that's what we're looking forward to here. But yeah, here's that we got the symposium here uh, coming up. It starts on Monday the twentieth, and uh, we have some sort of deal for you guys. Uh, sign up if you haven't signed up yet. So Malcolm's going to be uh, letting us know about that. Uh, when we send out the follow-up email here, so we're going to send you some cool links, a few of the resources we talked about today. We're going to send you the PowerPoint presentation, the notes, and we're going to send you the whole video so you can watch it. It's just going to be up on YouTube. You can share it with your friends. But, uh, whoa. Right. A couple of last questions. So actually, Samantha asked, so the symposium mics can be recorded? Yes, they'll be recorded uh, because we're going to do two per night. Uh, just kind of like going more deep dives into all those topics for five nights or 10, 10 sessions. And, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we really hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, it's been so fun talking about these guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've got some more. You can take some questions. You know, feel free to. Through some of the, I put out some of the really good mushroom books we have up here. Uh, yeah, we do have quite a few questions here. Okay, from the live audience here. Ooh, the Martelou Farmers Market? Yeah. Is that the one in Sea Space King Edward? Yes. Okay. 
and bring repeats. We don't do this. Mr. Grow It All. Mr. Grow It All. And he has phenomenal culinary. I should say, because she got me into oysters. That was the first time we had the clients meet, and this is where we taste as well. And mm. this was the first time we discovered uh, pink, uh, pink oysters. oysters. There's blue oyster oysters, uh, pink okay. oyster oysters. So, just for the people tuning in online, we got two hot tips on where to get lime in Calgary. One is the Maker's Market at Martaloo, and Steve facing Edward, and then yeah. Gra Granary Road. Yeah. Yes. I would love to go visit there one day. Well, Granary Road is closed right now for season. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's season so on the market. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, we had another question from the live audience here. Yeah, I'm going to say thank you for your enthusiasm for knowledge you're sharing. Very, very wonderful. But I have a quick question. I did not hear any talks. Oh, great. So, this was a question that we got from online as well. What about heavy metal detoxification with mushrooms? If I was going to choose any of them, I would choose the more bitter mushrooms, right? So I, I think red reishi might be one of your best choices. That bitterness is part of the liver detoxification and regeneration pathway. But specifically, there's other herbs that are more famous for that kind of thing. Hey, Malcolm? Yeah, I haven't heard or seen anything specifically about metal detox and mushrooms. Yeah, we got a blood purifier here, a liver regenerator, liver purifier. So, so actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, cilantro, chlorella, you know, these kinds of things. Yeah. Chelation therapy, uh, sulfur compounds. Okay. What help uh, detoxify the liver of say metals, but uh, yeah, there's a few, few good ones. Um, getting back to the court gesture one, right. yeah. um, the psychedelic ones. Uh, you mentioned the name of one of them. I know there's a lot of it. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, how do you spell it? Was it a, a beeswax? Oh, a what is the name of one of the core gestures? Well, it's Amanita, A M A N I T A, Amanita. And it's very fascinating. It has such a long history of use. Uh, so, this broadly access to them is going to come out more and more. Uh, basically, we're on the brink of decriminalization. I think right now there's so many dispensaries getting away with it because people have better things to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, like that. you can buy it online on my yeah. yeah, there's a company in Alberta that's actually growing them. I of Odin.ca. Uh, -E -E of Odin .ca. Uh, and they they do it, you know, kind of you can get the mushrooms themselves, you can get them powdered, you can get them in capsules, you can get them in like chocolates. But just remember, they're the core gestures for a reason because they can play tricks on you. They can play tricks on you. So make sure you keep your uh, keep your wits about you. They they love playing jokes on people. So you know, uh, usually for a bigger, deeper learning lesson. But it's a it's one of those those things to be very you know. Yes, tread, tread lightly there uh, in the beginning. Did you mention in one of the classes that that's where the uh, concept of Santa and flying reindeer came from? Yes, absolutely. The origins of Santa. Yeah, yeah. 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 the whole thing about the shamans and delivering little packages. Yeah, yeah. 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 time of year, 100%. Yeah, the flying reindeer. So they eat the amanita and uh, they process out some liver toxins and shamans are known to consume the pee of the reindeer and everyone's flying after that. <laughs> Red and white. Yeah. Yeah. We had some fun last year, hey Malcolm? We did the, we closed off the symposium last year with uh, Amanita Dreamer. She's this famous like Amanita lady. And uh, we had cons we consumed quite a bit, and I remember our bike ride home that night. Okay. 
don't know if it was just me, but I felt like I was like so fast. <laughs> Not sure. But it takes, yeah, it does have this effect that it can take away uh, these limits that you put on yourself kind of thing. Okay, we got some other great questions here. Um, so one was actually about storing mushrooms and the humidity. Um, I would say if you're working with fresh mushrooms, then you really need to get them dried as soon as possible. Um, I learned a tip last year at the symposium about if you have fresh psilocybin mushrooms, you can dry them, or the best way to store them is actually in honey. It's a very traditional method of storing psilocybin in honey. Otherwise, all the dried mushrooms need to be dried well and then kept at a low humidity. Uh, so they wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't mold or anything like that. What else is coming up for questions? You just got that one. Hey, Malcolm, the most yeah. effective method for delivery of mushrooms? Yeah, that, that one. I answered that one. Oh. So we, we do have an extra like really cool bonus class for the symposium. Uh, it's actually totally free to tune into online. Is that Tuesday uh, the 14th, Malcolm? Yeah. So we actually have Yero Willard um, giving us like a little bonus class about how to navigate the mushroom supplements shelves. So Yero is going to give us kind of a tour of some of the different uh, medicinal mushroom things that are out there. So we're gonna send the link to that too, that you can tune into, but that would be a good question here. Uh, that was for Aiden. Uh, he's gonna explore that. Is it better? Aiden's question from online was about the lion's mane. Is it better to be consuming the actual fruiting body or there's the mycelium products as well. They each, they're, they're actually, uh, each have their own uh, special place. Uh, okay, okay, thanks so much, thanks so much. Wow, it was that fascinating, thanks for this education. Aw, oh, thanks for tuning in everyone. Uh, stay tuned for your little follow-up email here. Oh, okay, and we have an, one last good question online. Okay, anyone else in the live audience here? Okay, one question here. Oh, so we just have a few really cool specimens here. This is a reishi that was cultivated from TNT. You can buy that in their produce section. These are reishis that grow in an antler form. We've got a whole bunch of fun little mushrooms here to check out. It's called a cinnabar polypore. Yeah, they all have medicinal aspects. This is a sculpture. <laughs> oh, this is called the red belt in polish. Yeah. Red belt. Okay, thanks for tuning in, everyone. And the final question here is how would you add medicinal mushrooms into the Lyme protocol? I would say yes. The medicinal mushrooms are famous for helping with Lyme. Take as much as you possibly can until the symptoms disappear and check out bunerhealinglime.com. The herbal protocol there helped, uh, helped, helped, helped a lot of people tremendously. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, I think uh, we'll see everyone uh, soon. So it's two weeks past. Only online at home, or is it here on? Like, oh, it's all going to be online. The okay. Piero is just going to zoom in. But you'll get the link for that. Uh, It'll be recorded as well. It'll be recorded as well. All right.